So as we were planning this summer sermon series, we thought to ourselves, yeah, why don't we tackle all the nice light issues uh, during the summertime? So, uh, so here we are. It seems to me that curiosity about death is a very natural thing, whether you are thinking about it from a religious perspective or not. In our family, our son Thomas has one living grandparent, his grandma, his nana Beth, Elena's mother. Both of my parents died many years back, my mother in 1995 and my father in 2005. And Elena's father, who Thomas did meet as an infant, died the summer that Thomas turned two. Thomas did get to meet him, and thanks to some pictures and lots of stories from Elena, her mother, and her sister, Thomas has a wonderful sense that he knew his Papa Tom. As parents, we have chosen to be straightforward with Thomas, explaining to him that these grandparents have died. Of course, this requires a bit more explanation as he is only four years old, but he does understand that they are no longer around and he can no longer see them. This little bit of exposure to death has in some ways raised a natural curiosity in Thomas as he has asked me whether I will one day die and whether he will one day die. Not for a long time, I assure him. Yet I know that he will have more questions as he gets older, and one will likely be what happens to us when we die. A question a child might ask, but not a childish question. As with so many other aspects of the Christian faith, there are a variety of perspectives on the answer to this question present within our faith tradition, each one faithful. One such perspective is captured in our scripture passage this morning, the story of the rich man and Lazarus. It is a multifaceted tale. As I mentioned last week when discussing what our faith has to say about money and wealth, there is within it a message about a, how a person of means treats others and the repercussions of that treatment. But at the core of the story, we have a description of a Christian perspective about what happens when we die. In this case, it is a moral tale about a selfish rich man who showed no compassion in his life, and as a result, is damned to suffer in Hades, where he was tortured. This is contrasted with a poor man who suffered in life, who is in the comforting presence of the ancestors, in this case, Abraham. In these few verses, what are probably the most common concepts of the afterlife in pop culture are captured. Heaven, in this case, is a reward where one who has died and is deserving goes to be with their ancestors and friends, and it is comforting. Hell, on the other hand, is a place of great suffering, serving as a punishment for the misdeeds of life. Such ideas have been a part of popular culture for generations. You might think about the shows or movies or even songs throughout your life that embody this concept of what comes after death, heaven and hell. In music, we hear tell of a stairway to heaven and a highway to hell. Currently, one of my favorite shows on television is The Good Place, which follows the stories of four individuals who have died and what the afterlife is like for them. If you've not seen it, I commend it to you. It is both interesting and funny Within it, we are exposed to ideas of both the good place, heaven, and the bad place, hell. This ever-present focus within the popular culture undergirds the idea that curiosity about, curiosity about what is next is a very natural thing for us, especially in a faith tradition that spends a fair amount of time on the topic. The people about whom the New Testament was written, as well as those for whom the New Testament was written, lived life in the shadow of and under the weight of the Roman Empire. For the Jewish people to whom Jesus and others spoke, while their faith tradition was tolerated, it was most definitely a marginalized existence. And for the earliest Christians, that marginalization was made worse by a popular disdain for the faith tradition. 
Simply, as we know, to embrace a Christian way of life in the first century meant exposing oneself to ridicule, abuse, perhaps even martyrdom. So from a practical perspective alone, it makes sense that a major focus of the tradition was placed on what happens after this life. In the fledgling years of a new movement, it might be considered necessary to offer some kind of incentive when choosing the way almost certainly meant difficulty. To that end, the promise of a blessed afterlife makes a lot of sense. Moreover, pairing that idea with the eternal damnation for those who mistreat us, the adherents of this new way most egregiously, of course, and the practical needs are met. This approach to the subject has been popular with other marginalized peoples throughout history, including slaves in this nation, and it serves as a core component of liberation theology. But that speaks only to the practical aspects of a movement seeking to establish itself and to grow. There is much more to answering this question about what our faith has to say about death, heaven, and hell. Much more that undergirds these beliefs. And that more is deeply theological in nature. Speaking to the very nature of God and God's relationship to humanity. Death, as we know, is an inevitability. All things that live will one day die. This truth is captured in the third chapter of Ecclesiastes in the familiar passage that begins, For every season, for everything there is a season, a time for every matter under heaven, a time to be born, and a time to die. And this truth is something embraced not only by the Christian faith, but in the wider culture as well. I am sure at some point you have heard the birds' arrangement of these words, to everything, turn, turn, turn. There is a season, turn, turn, turn. And a time for every purpose under heaven. And while the Hebrew scriptures at times suggest that a premature death, for certain kings, for instance, was a result of a lack of keeping with the covenant, our Christian faith, understanding the finite nature of life, looks upon death not as a punishment. Instead, the judgment that we find present in our scriptures is focused on what comes after death. We read in multiple places of how God will divide people in the afterlife. We read of sheep and goats. Sheep are good. Goats are bad. We hear of people of the light and people of the dark. Believers and non-believers. And we read of how those who were righteous will go to be with God while others will be cast out where there will be much weeping and gnashing of teeth. Again, these distinctions make sense for a fledgling movement attempting to distinguish itself from others and making truth claims over and against other traditions. There is a high level of import placed upon the ideal of belief in Jesus as the way to avoid eternal teeth gnashing. Yet to suggest that this more literal interpretation defines the Christian belief about death, heaven, and hell would ignore what has occurred in more than 2,000 years of Christian tradition and interpretation. Some in that time, as they have pondered the concept of salvation as it relates to getting into heaven, have chosen a more strict set of parameters. John Calvin, for one, declared a belief in double predestination, a concept that suggests that one is predestined from before their birth for eternal salvation in heaven or eternal damnation in hell. Such ideas are based in an understanding of God as loving those who are elect, but passing judgment on those who are not. It speaks then to the nature of God, balancing love and judgment. Our passage hints at such an understanding of God as for the earliest Christians, judgment was for the people that persecuted them. And such ideas of judgment and damnation persist today in many Christian circles. On the other end of the extreme continuum, there are many who hold to the ideal of universal salvation, believing that all people, as beneficiaries of God's love, will be welcomed into God's loving, comforting presence. Such a belief preferences 
the promises of an all-loving, all-forgiving God over and against stories like the one we heard this morning. For according to this perspective, even the rich man, despite his transgressions in life, finds comfort after death. In our own denomination, the United Church of Christ, should you seek out a statement of beliefs in this realm, you might look at the UCC's statement of faith, which includes the line, God promises to all who trust in the gospel forgiveness of sins and fullness of grace, courage in the struggle for justice and peace, and presence and the presence of the Holy Spirit in trial and rejoicing, and eternal life in that kingdom which has no end. I share that acknowledging that, of course, this is a historical statement of our denomination, and one I suspect, given our strong belief in the personal freedom to believe as you will, would not be agreed upon by everyone in the UCC and would actually be hotly debated in our time, even among fellow UCCers. It will not entirely surprise you to know that you will find Christians today, and likely throughout the history of our faith, who believe simply that when one dies, they are simply dead, discounting all ideas of heaven or hell. My friends, each one of these perspectives is faithful, as are the many others that exist along the long continuum of belief on this subject. Some might say that the frustration over the lack of clarity is due to the fact that the only way we can truly know about the afterlife is to die. Yet having said that, I also know that there are many who have experiences they believe have given them a glimpse. At this moment, I must admit that I have Louis Armstrong running through my head. You say potato, I say potato. You say tomato, I say tomato. Potato, potato, tomato, tomato. Let's call the whole thing off. And I guess we could give in to the temptation to simply move on. I mean, the preacher's been talking for... About 15 minutes already. And where are we? Different people believe different things. But what am I going to tell Thomas? Perhaps I have been going about this all wrong. For when we ask the question about what our faith has to say about death, like so many aspects of our faith, what we will get is a wide range of answers. But if we come at it in a different way, what do we believe about God? Do we believe that God loves us? All of us? Do we believe that God is truly gracious and that grace is for all? Do we believe that God forgives our debts or trespasses or sins? Forgives all of us? When we answer these questions, we may better be able to determine what we believe. For the actions of God must be consistent with the nature of God. So one day when Thomas asks me that question, I can remind him that God loves him. And that love is for all people and it is not something that can be limited, even by death. Just like I still love my parents. And he still loves his Papa Tom. And while we cannot be sure exactly what happens, we know that whatever it is, it will embody God's love for him, now and always. To me, that simple idea is what our faith has to say about these complex concepts. I wonder what you think. Amen.